Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How many of you are using visuals in your classroom in general? Not the Lauren series, but oh, quite a few of you. And what's been the reaction of your students when you're bringing in uh, visual images to teach a particular topic? It's a very good point of reference. Uh, mm -hmm. When I use the Manifest Destiny mm -hmm. artwork, um, there are lots of very difficult concepts in that painting. And as we go through that chapter, I, I tell them to remember the picture so that they remember the concepts right. and provide them with a visual basis. Right, right. Okay, yes, there. Well, I also remind them that, you know, centuries ago, that the paintings were, the, were, were taught people. In other words, Giotto series taught them what they should know about the life of Christ and things like that. So it really was, they're reading the paintings as well. It's right. a different kind of reading, right. but it's much like how for thousands of years people did learn about things exactly. using visual images. I think yes. also things that they haven't experienced in their own personal lives, especially for younger students, it just opens up that window and makes mm -hmm. it a little more accessible to understanding the concept in the whole. Well, what I've done is ask them to try to describe using your, your vocabulary history to describe the content of the picture or the images you see so that then you learn uh, about the extent of vocabulary and you use that to add to a more fuller description of the painting or the piece of art. Mm -hmm. And the woman behind you, I think you had no, your I hand up. They understand the pictures more so than well, they like it better than they read it because right. it's like a universal language. Everybody can look at a picture right. and understand what's going on. Right. I mean, our huh, visual environment is pretty rich. <laughs> There's a lot to look at. There's a lot to take in. And, you know, I think for some of us, maybe of a certain age or whatever, you take things for granted. You don't necessarily critically analyze and evaluate and think through and apply and think like are these the same sorts of images that other folks are seeing in other communities you know what are some of the stories that are behind some of these visual sources that we're inundated with in our advertisement or you know if we're looking at illustrations or drawings cartoons whatever the case may be oil paintings photography whatever so one of the things that we feel very passionate about here at the American Social History Project is that our visual evidence ought to be aggressively interrogated as much as textual evidence would, right? Your speeches or your letters or what have you. And our orientation around the visual is to really help you fill out the picture. Look at where this image was produced, by whom, what the content present in the image is speaking about, the meaning behind it, where it was exhibited, why it was exhibited, who saw it, who didn't see it, how accessible it was or was not, and how do we place that image in the larger study of these big events happening in American history? Where is its place? How can it help, again, fill out this picture of the story? So one of the most, I think, at least the most profound examples of um, all of these kinds of questions and elements in our visual environment um, that reflects an important period in American history is Lawrence's Great Migration Series, or Migration Series, right? And the series very succinctly addresses the historical understandings that you all are talking through. Why did African Americans leave the South and move to the North? What causes occurred? What were the effects uh, of this change? Uh, why did it happen in this year as opposed to another year? What were people and families saying to each other about living in the North or, or living in the South? Violence and um, job opportunities, all of that. These themes are reflected in the migration series. And you know, one of the, I think, kind of subsidiary questions may be, you know, what is a history painter? <laughs> you know, Jacob Lawrence, who is Jacob Lawrence? He's in fact a product of the migration. He's also a passionate researcher. And we just mentioned the Schomburg. That's actually the location 
where he did his research for the migration series. So to backtrack a little bit, his background is this. His, uh, I think his mom was from Virginia, his father was from South Carolina, and they felt compelled to move north for better job opportunities, living conditions, etc., for the children. Lawrence was actually born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and that's one of the places where his parents went because that's where the work was. They subsequently moved to Pennsylvania, and then they moved to Harlem. He was about 13 years old at the time. And in Harlem, he encountered a rich visual world that really propelled him into his work in fine art. So with that, I'm talking about the way people dress, the way people interacted with each other, the stories they would tell about their families, about friends, particularly folks who were moving north from southern towns, why they were moving, um, what they expected to encounter when they reached here, uh, the music of the period, the literary production, all of these different elements he sought to represent in these 60 panels. And uh, as a passionate observer and a researcher, he actually, and because he was kind of living the experience himself, he made the size of the panels really, really small. Have, did folks say that they had actually yeah, seen the yeah. series? Right? Mm -hmm. how, how big are those panels? Can you just, just quickly them. describe? Yeah. They're like so, yeah? And like this, right? Yeah. And they're both in vertical form, I'm sorry, horizontal form and vertical form, right? Now, today they're split up into two different institutions. The Museum of Modern Art has 30 of them, the even number ones. And Phillips Collection has the other 30, the odd number ones. But every couple of years, let's say decades actually, they put them all together, <laughs> they update some of the uh, reference material on it, and it'll tour or it'll be at either location. So uh, there are several books that you can get to um, see the panels uh, exclusive in, in its entirety. And then you do have this resource book here. Um, let's look at actually some of the images from the 60 panel set and give each other a greater idea of what we're talking about here. So, uh, if I hadn't mentioned before, they were produced between 1940 and 1941. And uh, guess how old he was? What might you think? I mean, this is 25. Yeah, you read the material. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was. He was 24 years old, and uh, he was actually the benefit of the Harlem Art Workshop. That uh, it was a small art workshop that took place in the basement of the Schomburg Library on 135th Street and Lenox Avenue and Malcolm X Boulevard. And he would go there and take classes in, uh, in, in paintings, and, you know, arts and crafts classes. And in fact, his mentors there, his teachers there, were very prominent um, African-American artists, people like Augusta Savage, who was a sculptor, and Charles Alston, who was a painter. and he also was uh, a reader of uh, Harlem Renaissance literature and poetry, so he read the works of um, philosopher Elaine Locke and Langston Hughes and uh, Claude McKay. So again, he infused a lot of different influences into his work. And one of the, this actually is the very first panel. Um, what do you see going on in this image? Yes. Oh, you see that there's three uh, destinations that people can go to, and that there's many, many people going in each direction. Right. Okay. Other folks? But yes, sir. Well, you see uh, the different type of clothing that they're wearing, mm -hmm. the different sort of style of clothing, the styles of hats, mm -hmm. but they all headed to work. Anyone else? What do you see? What's happening? Yes. Um, it looks like a large majority of them are going to Chicago and New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a rush. There's a rush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. That's a really, 
very important point, right? Yeah. So he's really trying to do a couple of different things in these little teeny panels, right? He's giving us some information on geography, right? Uh, transportation, um, kind of a sociological study or uh, groups. Um, you know, there's some economic information involved there, work, better living conditions, better life. Uh, there's a lot of different things occurring here, and he really sort of mixes all these different elements up in these panels. Um, and in fact, his method of creating these works were really interesting because he laid out all the panels on a floor and did kind of the sketchings for each of them and then started to apply these rich colors. Now, what do you think about the colors here? Yes? There's a lot of outdoor kind of color uh -huh. in the foreground with the figure, people, green, earth tones, and then there's uh, this grid and these neutrals mm -hmm. in the back. And I think for me that separates agricultural from industrial setting. Great observation. Yeah, let's look at another one. What do you see? Oh, new, new hand here. Yes. Well, I see groups of people that look like carrying their belongings in a certain direction. They're also like the flow of the birds. Mm -hmm. They're like almost following the flow of the birds mm -hmm. towards the left. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Oh, yes. People don't have faces. Yes. They're just people. They're unidentifiable. So you can't read their expression, see emotion on them. You just uh -huh. see people. And what do you, why do you think he did that? Why would that be important? Maybe because they're moving in such a large group. He didn't want to focus on the individual. He wants to focus on the group as a whole. Right, right. So we know that there are personal individual stories because they're you know, individual bodies but there's also a larger narrative occurring. That folks have a connection through this larger, larger experience. Yes? Yes, it adds to that. I think that's why maybe he paints them so close together. Like in a group, like there's a lot of space in the picture, like behind, but he doesn't have them separated. He has them all pushed together. Exactly. There's, all, all, there's almost like a triangular formation going on there. It's very astute about his design and layout and the different forms. Yes, the new hand, well, thank you. Pictures one and three, there's absence of color in the background, led me to think of like, uh, could be some emptiness of hope or a promise of hope, really doesn't have that much of a color. And then uh, maybe the faith that you would have to have to continue going on into a destiny pretty much unsure. Mm -hmm. So I noticed the compact of color centralized in the forefront of the picture itself, but then as we move to the background, how it disappears, but the absence of color actually gives it a little bit more richness, a little bit more of an open opportunity for what may come. Right, and so what do we know about <coughs> the individuals or the whole communities? Why are they traveling away from their homes? They're leaving for jobs. They're leaving, They're leaving for jobs, right? Yes. Are they for jobs also, maybe because of the organized violence that's occurring in the South, and their fear for their life? Mm -hmm. And also, I just, just to know, maybe there's a, there's a common struggle. They all have this common struggle right. to get to the North and facing similar challenges. Maybe that's why he's not showing the individual faces. Right. Yes. There's a common mm -hmm. unifying force why they're leaving. Yeah, there's still a lot of questions, right? Right. You know, they know the South, <laughs> they know that experience very well, but who knows what they're about to get involved in, right? There's, there's experience in the South with Jim Crow laws, discrimination, racial violence, etc. and what are their expectations about the North? How will they be received? It's really unclear. Did I see a hand here? Yeah. Yes, um, please, sir. In addition to the lynchings that they uh, faced in the South, also um, better education opportunities in the North. Uh, certainly, they were at a disadvantage in the South. So, uh, 